trade is the key to prosperity. Free trade will bring on a great depression. The North American Union is the merger of the United States, Mexico, and Canada into one super country. I don't see the likelihood of establishing a North American Union in our lifetimes. The road to North American Union is not a new development. Canadians are saying no to the North American Union and yes to Canada's sovereignty. The discussion here, and certainly I've been part of it and, and an advocate of it in a way, is that Canada the US, the US should seek to have a deeper type of integration with more predictable rules. Our economies now are very integrated. Our societies are growing increasingly integrated. What's needed now is a North American idea for all three. What kind of stuff was discussed at this meeting regarding the future of North America? I don't remember exactly. There are clear economic benefits from having a common currency. And he said himself, there will be a North American Union, a one North American currency called the Miro. I'm a staunch Canadian nationalist because of globalism. It's essentially the centralization of power into fewer hands. Canadians, Americans, and Mexicans will lose their sovereignty. Maybe national sovereignty is not such a good thing. I don't buy into the conspiracy theories around meetings. Do not be embarrassed. Do not be shy. Do cares if they call you conspiracy theorists. This is the truth. You get political change of fundamental nature of this sort only if you have a real big earth-shaking event. It's not going to stop with the North American Union. It's going to be one further step along the road to one world government. <laughs> one world government? <laughs> yeah. Um, I personally think it will come. It will come. In your time serving as the Canadian Ambassador to the United States and subsequently helping forge the free trade agreement between Canada and the U.S., did you ever discuss the possibility of creating a North American Union that would be much like the existing European Union? No, that was never discussed, no. I, I think this was seen when it was launched by the Mulroney government in 1985. It was seen as a trade agreement. We didn't even talk of it at that time. The government did not want to talk of it at that time as a free trade agreement. It was seen as a comprehensive trade agreement with the United States, not with Mexico or any other partner. It was bilateral in concept. As time went on, we began to talk about it on both sides of the border as a free trade agreement. But there was never a notion, to my knowledge, anywhere in the system uh, up on top or in the bowels that thought of this as a North American Union. After the Free Trade Agreement was signed in 1989, it came into force. The United States and Mexico decided that they wanted to have a similar agreement. And they began to, they proposed negotiations on a bilateral basis between the two countries to have another FTA of their own. Canada was concerned about that because we felt, among other things, that it could be a painful experience if Mexico, for example, were able to get a better deal than we did or get concessions that we didn't in order to protect our interests. Uh, and they were actually going to model their agreement on the Candy West Agreement. It was going to be a Candy West Agreement, whatever add-ons they could put or adjustments. So we said, well, we want to be part of the negotiation. So then NAFTA came into existence and you had there for the first time the notion of trilateralism or a North American continent. One has to look at what has been the, the effects of uh, these agreements. And they've been very good for some powerful sectors and not at all good for um, poorer people, for working people, for those that um, are not 
benefiting from, from corporate profits. So here in Canada, for example, since we signed the uh, bilateral free trade agreement with the United States, two-thirds of Canadian families have experienced a decline in their real incomes. Uh, also, if we want to talk about the North American Free Trade Agreement in Mexico, some two million Mexican uh, campesinos, that is peasant farmers, have been displaced from their land. Some have migrated to cities, about half a million every year try to enter illegally into the United States to find work. So it's not so good for people at the bottom of the social ladder. The Zapatistas who launched their rebellion on January 1st, 1994, accusing uh, the problems of Chiapas on NAFTA got it backwards. Uh, the problem of Chiapas in southern Mexico and all of southern Mexico is not NAFTA, it's the absence of NAFTA. It's I think the, the beauty of North America is that our three countries are pragmatic and they're problem solvers. They ask themselves, we've got a problem here in our economy, we've got a problem here on our borders, we have a problem in the environment, how are we going to solve it? Uh, is the best way to solve it is if we do it at the local level, at the national level, uh, or would it make more sense if we explored it at the continental level or the global level? Uh, we determined a long time ago that the best way to deal with trade is at the global level. The General Agreements on Tariff and Trade in 1947 uh, decided on a course that would systematically over time dismantle trade barriers. And they have. They brought them down very far. Not far enough, but they brought them down very far. That was done at the global level. I'd be in favor of continuing down that path of negotiating between sovereign governments to solve different problems, to create an institution, create a broader sense of identity or of North Americanness as part of an instrument to help us avoid our parochialism and solve shared problems. NAFTA was essentially a business contract aimed at dismantling trade and investment barriers uh, and assuring all three countries that their sovereignty would not be affected by this and that they would remain independent. Now, one of the major concerns uh, that Canada and Mexico had about NAFTA uh, was that it might open their uh, capital to being taken over by U.S. multinational corporations. If you are a large corporation and you are given national treatment with any country, meaning as a corporation, even if you're a foreign corporation, which most of the Canadians, uh, Canada's primary corporations are foreign controlled these days, uh, that you're given the rights of a citizen in that nation with the powers of a citizen. And corporate rule uh, is pretty much free trade. <laughs> but where it sits right now is that as the corporations have gained uh, the status of citizens, they can challenge our laws. So even if uh, municipalities, federal or provincial bodies establish laws for our country, uh, for the best interest of our country based on our collective will, then the corporations can successfully challenge those laws and sue us for passing laws that infringe upon their investments and in their trade. And these are the provisions that allow a corporation uh, to sue a national government if it feels it is not getting the treatment it would be entitled to under NAFTA. The first case against Canada under the investor state uh, provisions was a, a suit brought by Ethel Corporation from the US that was wanting to market in Canada a gasoline additive called MMT, which is a suspected neurotoxin. It was stated by our government that we're going to ban uh, um, additives to fuel that involve methyl manganese because uh, it's harmful to individuals neurologically and otherwise. It's been linked to attention deficit disorder and other problems. But when we passed those laws, the ethyl group sued our country, said, how dare you pass laws that restrict our trade, and even we're doing it for the benefit of our own country. Well, Canada, the Canadian government, uh, responded to that suit by effectively apologizing to Ethel by paying them 13 million dollars US in compensation and by withdrawing the ban. So it didn't even have to go through the full adjudication process before Canada backed down. Our country is being defined and shaped by regulatory bodies 
by corporations who have no accountability whatsoever to the Canadian people. I don't see that these, uh, th th this uh, harmonization, unionization is good for the Canadian people, period. Never was, never will be. It needs to stop. Now, there have been 50 uh, suits approximately under the investor state uh, provisions so far. I say approximately because some of them are still secret. We don't know. There have been 19 against Canada, 17 against Mexico, and 14 against the United States. And of these, uh, Canada has, has settled out of court or lost four cases, Mexico has lost three cases, and the United States has not lost any because adjudicators are very reluctant to use this against U.S. When Brian Mulroney uh, proposed the free trade agreement, it was a Canadian initiative. It wasn't that popular with public opinion, but it was a major initiative which um, we initiated, which the U.S. President Ronald Reagan got fully behind. The free trade agreement was, you know, perhaps one of the most dramatic of any period in our history, but there, uh, uh, the public attitudes changed. The public went from negative to positive, and even to this day, I mean, depends the questions you ask, but on the whole, attitudes are fairly positive towards free trade. Free trade is not good for any nation that's involved in free trade. No nation benefits from free trade. How would you feel about a North American Union, kind of like a European Union, between Canada, the U.S., and Mexico? I think that would... That would probably not work. That would not work. <laughs> not bad. That wouldn't be a good idea. I think okay. maybe Canada and the US yeah. would be okay together. Not, I don't think Mexico. We shouldn't do that. Because at that point, Canada is no longer going to be Canada. Canada has a hard enough time keeping its identity. I'm a Canadian, so I want to stick with my country. I, I just can't see uh, that being favorable for a Canadian in any way, shape, or form. We're still under British control, partially. Mm -hmm. So we can't really. So I don't, that wouldn't happen. Like, I, I, definitely I, wouldn't, wouldn't I wouldn't like it anyways. The World Trade Organization is the only international organization dealing with the global rules of trade between nations. Its main function is to ensure that trade flows as smoothly, predictably, and freely as possible. The result is a more prosperous, peaceful, and accountable economic world. What's the WTO all about? It's all about greed. It's all about. Look at these kids up here. They got a sign up that says, don't trade our future. For these young kids in the street today, it's about their future being traded off by corporations who frankly don't give a shit what happens to them. That's what it's about. That's what people are fed up with it. They understand it. Direct action brought these people together. Many of them on the street I've talked to have never been in a direct action before. They feel very empowered. They're, they're starting to understand that people can be empowered and take charge of things themselves. And direct action is perfect for getting people in that role to take charge over their own lives. I go back to the 1988 election, which was bought, fought on the issue of free trade. And the opponents of free trade actually uh, won the majority of the vote. The Mulroney government was elected with a minority, a minority of votes. At that time, we had a high level of participation from all sectors of society. Now, it's true that since then, the issue has faded from consciousness. But I think there are moments uh, when symbolic issues, for example, Canadian water and sovereignty over our fresh water, there still are elements that would like to, to get a hold of that and would like to use some of the possible leverage through NAFTA, including the proportional sharing clause, to open up the floodgates. So I think there will be moments when symbolic issues like water will come to the fore and we will have a resurgence of interest in, in the, these issues. From the U.S. perspective, um, the largest source of energy imports by far uh, is from Canada and Mexico. Roughly one-third of our total uh, energy imports come from our two neighbors. Proportional sharing clause is very important because it's unique to all international trade agreements that I have ever studied. 
it effectively makes Canada an energy colony. What the clause says is if Canada were to take measures to conserve some of our non-renewable hydrocarbons, natural gas and petroleum, if we take those measures, we still have to uh, export to the United States uh, the same proportion of our oil or gas exports that were sold over the th previous three years. What if Canada wanted to preserve 10% of our uh, of petroleum production for future generations and for conservation purposes. Well, when you work through the numbers and you find that we're obliged to sell the U.S. two-thirds of the petroleum we produce, the effect of, of applying the proportional sharing clause could actually mean there would be shortages to meet the needs of Canada. Canada is a great multicultural, uh, multilateral country. We need Canada's leadership and ingenuity to develop new commissions or organizations whose purpose is to graft a North American vision onto the landscape and push forward for North American policies and institutions as well. So I hope that Canada sees within itself the capacity to have a big effect and to take the lead. And if it took the lead and worked closely with Mexico, my guess is the United States would be very agreeable to that. They don't really need the money. As you can see, housing is natural, you say, it's natural material. The fruits, all of this they have, they have farming, they have hunting. They have everything they need to live and more. But then they get the progress arriving to these towns, power lines, running water. And these are services that you need to pay for. You cannot pay with a bag of corn. You need to pay with cash. So they start needing the money, getting in the capitalism system, and that's when poverty arrives to these towns. You know, they need the money, okay, I have some money, I buy a radio and a TV, I see what the, what's on TV, it's pure marketing. Things that they didn't need for over 2,000 years, in a decade they start needing. Pues bueno, el Tratado de Libre Comercio, como tú sabes, no todos estamos realmente informados como se O sea, en lo único que nos afecta es en la desinformación, ¿me explico? We all have the capacity to admit free trade. We don't know how to benefit free trade. We are the same, or better, with this crisis that we have. It's really difficult. The situation. I think that the Mexican product goes to a low price and goes back to a higher price. It's affected because lo que puede ser México consumir y nosotros consumir nuestro producto tenemos que mandarlo para allá. How has the experience in México been um, uh, in terms of NAFTA since it started 15 years ago? Ha sido una situación positiva, ha mejorado realmente la Eh, el comercio entre los tres países. Sin embargo, lo, lo que sí te puedo decir que eh, hubo ciertos acuerdos dentro del mismo, eh, nosotros le llamamos TLC o Telecam, que no se cumplieron como es la situación del, del transporte, que es por eso que ahorita volvieron a grabar, o sea, hay que pagar impuestos por algunos productos norteamericanos. No estamos informados al 100% de qué se trata el impuesto. O sea, si a nosotros nos informaran como comerciantes qué vínculo nosotros tendríamos con el, con el Tratado de Libre Comercio, sabríamos realmente de qué se trata o qué lo compone al 100%. Pero como no tenemos ese tipo de información, es muy difícil que todos, en concreto, expresemos en qué nos beneficia y en qué no. Given the similarities of our two economies, of our two cultures and our countries, it seemed to me doable to achieve, to pursue what I, I've always referred to as, as a kind of common economic space, a single economic space, where the border becomes irrelevant. I think Mexico could become part of it, um, as indeed uh, NAFTA was modeled after the Canada-US agreement. And as the Europeans, as, as you will know from the whole history of the European community, the remarkable achievements they've had, it's all been incremental over the years at different speeds. 
they've been doing it incrementally for years. Um, the European Union was initially started with a, an agreement in the 1950s to regulate the production of steel among all the European countries. And the argument then was that you'd hate to have a country like Germany corner the market on steel and develop an empire that would attack the rest of Europe again. So they had a reason based on recent history at the time, which said we need to, uh, we need to have a, an agreement that regulates production of steel across Europe. And from there, they built on it with subsequent agreements. The road to North American Union um, is not a, no, a new development. Uh, probably it kicked into high gear in about 1965 with the creation of the Council on the Americas, and David Rockefeller was the founder of that. And there was a meeting down in Central America between, it would have been then Prime Minister Lester B. Pearson and uh, Lyndon Johnson. And they discussed um, all of these things that we're, that we're seeing now. They discussed uh, the creation of one North American um, uh, market, uh, one North American currency. There's a distinction between a, a customs union and a monetary union. A customs union is a common external tariff. It's a logical extension of a free trade agreement and basically says that the tariffs that all three countries have with the outside world will be the same. Right now they're different. Uh, theoretically we have no tariffs between our countries, but on the, the perimeter of our countries we utilize different tariffs. That proves to be extremely inefficient and costly. Uh, for our own commerce because everything has to stop at our regular borders to see what amount of the content was made in North America and what was outside. So it's, it's a self-defeating proposition. It would be far better if we could come up with a way to eliminate what's called rules of origin, have a common external tariff which is called the customs union. Completely different from that is a monetary union with a single currency. That is a very complicated task. The Europeans had been struggling with it for over 30 years. And they tried and failed through a variety of different techniques before they finally, in 1999, uh, implemented the euro. In 1999, when the euro was created, because of my background, I thought that the same arguments that made the euro such an attractive innovation that the people actually went with it purely on economic terms, um, also would apply to North America. And I had this idea of writing a paper in which I outlined what would be the benefits to Mexico, Canada, and the United States for creating the equivalent of the Euro. And I had the idea, the inspiration to call it the Amero. I think one thing people who are dollar-based need to focus on is the Amero. That's the one thing that nobody's talking about that I think is going to have a big impact on, uh, on everybody's life in Canada, the U.S. and uh, Mexico. If you Google it, you'll find out all about it. Well, you could tell us a little bit more right now. You always hear it on CNBC, don't you? <laughs> the Amero is the proposed new currency for the North American community, which is being uh, developed right now between Canada, the U.S., and Mexico to make a borderless community, much like the EU, and uh, the dollar, Canadian dollar, U.S. dollar, and the Mexican peso replaced by the Amero. You, um, you really think that will get any, any leeway? Uh, you may want to visit a couple of websites and see how far along it is. The Canadians are pretty upset about it, whereas the Americans, apart from the Texans, um, are the only people who know anything about it. The, the rest of the public's really uh, sort of with their head in the sand on this one. There is a, a group of people out there who believe that there exists a conspiracy to deprive the United States and Mexico and that's where the center of these conspiracy theorists is. They are worried that uh, there was a, a conspiracy to rob the two countries of their national sovereignty and uh, through the back door bring in socialism and various other kinds of things. This is, of course, nonsense. It, it's a little bit like the story about Kennedy's assassination. People still don't believe that Oswald did it. There's a whole uh, industry out there. There's a quarter of all Americans or something like this still think that Elvis Presley lives. I would put the stories that these guys are manufacturing essentially into that category. I cannot deal with it. 
I am not following it. I hear about it because, as far as I'm concerned, it is just uh, a conspiracy theory. The idea that I am associated with and that I'd like to push is that there are clear economic benefits from having a common currency. The basic economic argument in favor of a common currency is that you have lower transactions costs for firms that are exporting, importing, making investments, and secondly, that the cost of borrowing that is highly correlated with the cost that has to be paid by the federal government, cost of borrowing by other jurisdictions, corporations, consumers, mortgages, they all would be lowered to the benefit of Canada. In 1974, uh, as a condition of joining at the time this G7, this group of seven, which became the G8, which is now the group of 20, uh, this was following something called uh, the Morris, uh, Milton Friedman School of Business in Chicago. And they thought, well, it's better to give the banking industry of countries to the private uh, markets and let it be handled there and go with the ebb and flow. But as a condition of being a part of these groups, Nations have to give up the control of issuing themselves their own credit, of, of loaning to themselves. And because we chose to do this, because we thought being part of this group of seven or group of eight, now G20, was a good thing for Canada, we stopped using our Bank of Canada to fund our infrastructure. We don't borrow from ourselves anymore. We borrow from the private banking cartel. The outcome should be clear. On a board that determines what the interest rate would be for a North American Amero area, would have to give greater power to the country that represents 70% of the entire economic activity and financial power, the United States, and only, say, 15% for Mexico at the moment and 15% for Canada. The most important thing about this kind of a central bank is that the politicians have to stay out of it completely. Central banks should be removed from the control, the clutches of politicians, should be given a constitution which says, thou shalt only be responsible for price stability. Politicians still play a role because they have to appoint the people to the boards which determine the day-to-day uh, -day policies which in the end, are supposed to have the outcome of price stability. To give up this right to uh, lend to ourselves is, is absurd, because what has happened? We've gone from an $18 billion deficit to a, up to a $588 billion deficit, of which about 95% of that is compound interest. And money, we're paying interest to who? Well, there's no person out there who has a Canadian flag, who lives in Canada, who we pay $60 billion in interest, both federally, provincially, and at the municipal levels too. We're paying someone else interest on the money that we can print and, and produce ourselves and lend it to ourselves to fund our infrastructure, to fund our social programs, to fund our education for our university students who are also being put in a debt trap. But uh, as you give up control of your currency, and William Lyon Mackenzie King said it most, uh, most poignantly when he said this, he said, you know, the issuance of the credit and currency is the state's most precious resource. And once you give up that control, it matters not who makes the laws of the land, because usury, once in control, will wreak havoc on any nation. All right, ladies and gentlemen, here we are at the Federal Reserve. As I said once before, this is uh, the very institution that is highly responsible uh, for bankrupting uh, America and essentially enslaving the world under a perpetual debt system. It's by no way federal, and there are certainly no reserves. What's your full name? What's that? What's your full name? Is there any reason why you need my full name? I'm not just asking what's your name. What's your partner's name? Well, you can ask him. Hey, boss. What's your name? It's essentially the centralization of power into fewer hands. That's what's going on. Um, Canadians, Americans, and Mexicans will lose their sovereignty, their, their right to govern themselves as an individual nation. Um, and the, the economies of all three of the nations will be merged into fewer and fewer hands. 
I can see an obvious, clear problem with that. Um, the, the, the moment that power um, gets diverted into fewer hands, you, you got to be concerned. We have a lot of people here still who believe that having a picture of the Queen is a wonderful thing and that uh, it is a symbol of nationhood. It is a slippery slope of losing the Canadian national identity by uh, having on our day-to-day, -day, every day we're looking at coins and, 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 and bills, and there we see George Washington, you know, rather than the Queen or another symbol of Canada. And that sort of pervades the psyche and reduces national sovereignty. It is the merger of the United States, Mexico, and Canada into one super country. It's like NAFTA on steroids. And it's about bringing all three countries together into one country, joining our governments, our currencies, our military. I had the pleasure of interviewing former president of Mexico, Vicente Fox, and he said himself there will be a North American Union. Can you please talk about how you, as president of Mexico, President Bush, and the prime minister of Canada established working groups towards a North American Union? There is the, the original document, the original commitment, and uh, there is supposed to be follow-up uh, procedures, there is supposed to be committed committees uh, to discuss and to advance, but that's not happening. Will there be a North American Union? Do you believe there will there be a North American Union? I would hope so. I think it would be very convenient for both of us. When Vincente Fox, in the 1990s was a candidate for presidency of Mexico. I was at a conference and I sat next to him at dinner and on the other side of Fox was Robert Mandel, whom I mentioned already as the father of the European Monetary Union. And we impressed him obviously with the idea that there would be great benefits for Mexican economy from this. He had no difficulty accepting it because he was a successful businessman before he became a politician. He was the uh, president of uh, Coca-Cola Mexico. So when he was elected, he went on a courtesy visit to the White House. And the press release at that time said that he raised with President Clinton the idea that we should push forward on a North American Monetary Union. It was said that he did the same thing when he got to Ottawa and talked to Chrétien. We have had opinion surveys which showed that the idea of a common currency with, North Am with the Americans and Canadians is totally unacceptable to Mexicans for nationalistic reasons. They want to maintain Mexico as a clear, identifiable, nation and culture. And for some reason, word has spread amongst them that this is the first step towards absorption by the Americans. Say you, you've heard about the Amero currency. Mm -hmm. Where did you Where did you hear about it? I read in the newspaper two months ago. Yes. Yeah. For the Amero, like the Mexican people, is why it's my my peso is. I don't want another currency. Mm -hmm. I am Mexican. I, I like my peso. Yeah. I don't need I don't need a new currency. <laughs> Lo que había escuchado últimamente que se iba a tratar de estabilizar la economía y se iba a manejar solamente un solo capital, que es los comentarios que dicen para que esto se estabilice y tenga una estabilidad, pero eso lo escuchaba que iba a ser dentro de 5 o 6, hasta creo que dentro de 10 años más, menos que no sé ahorita si anda funcionando eso. 
And this whole new world order ideation is a bunch of uh, banking and intellectual elites that, uh, that basically see the same sort of mentality. Control the economy. Control the issuance of currency. You control the nation. And now control the food. You control the people. Let me control the issuance of currency and credit of the nations. And I don't care who you put in power because they know control the money. You control the nation. And society, we're not aware of this. But this is all part of this whole uh, globalization scheme that's happening right now. Even to raise those kinds of issuers, to raise the euro current, the Amero currency issue is to inflame a lot of the people who are most fearful about integration. Uh, so for those reasons, I say leave them aside. Uh, we, have some, we have some preliminary steps uh, uh, before we get to a point where we can seriously entertain that. The trouble with the monetary union is that there's tremendous symbolic attachment to our currencies. Uh, although, if you step back, you would say, certainly the Greek drachma, uh, or the French franc, or the German Deutschmark, uh, or the Spanish peso, uh, would be far more delicate uh, and important to those countries. Uh, because in some of those countries, they've used the same currency for thousands of years, uh, whereas we haven't even uh, existed for 300 years uh, in North America. Uh, so, if they were ever, over, ever able to, if they were able to overcome their fear of losing this distinctive cultural item, defining their country like Greece for 3,000 years. Certainly, it shouldn't be that hard for Canadian or Americans uh, or even the Mexicans uh, to contemplate a different currency. I happen to believe that it would be beneficial to our three countries to begin studying this issue seriously because it is not a simple step to go from uh, a national currency to a unified currency. It is very hard. And the European experience shows uh, that countries have got to find a way uh, to consult on macroeconomic policy and budgets and deficits and debts uh, uh, and establish indicators that would reduce the distortion between economies before you even take the first step toward a common currency. I believe the American people, the Canadians, the Mexicans are practical people. Uh, you have to make a convincing case that moving towards a unified currency will be demonstrably better for their standard of living than under the current system right now. We should proceed by letting the academics study this for us. Think about it as much as possible. Help us to understand what the hazards and the benefits are before the people make uh, calculate whether it's in their benefit or not. Well, of course, he'll also give you the line that he never ever talked about a North American union, that he's always advocated a North American community. But if you read what he has to say, what he envisages is this North American community uh, would be organized, you would have basically three very powerful institutions that would basically correspond with a, a judicial and a legislative branch uh, and a, um, an executive type branch which would um, the the executive branch would would steer the agenda for the three the three countries Canada the US and Mexico you would have essentially a North American Parliament to mirror the the three separate independent um, uh, legislative bodies in the in the three countries and uh, and then you would have a, um, a North American uh, court which would adjudicate on, uh, on disputes, etc. Well, that sounds an awful lot like a North American Union to me. Mm -hmm. He can call it a community if he wants it, but now we're just parsing terms, silly semantics. It's important to know when we're in, the, in your talking about this subject that nobody here is talking about a political union. They're talking about a economic and political arrangements which deepen integration and the relationship but in which the countries, as in Europe itself, sit, preserve, maintain their sovereignty. We're talking about the, the virtual destruction of, uh, of a sovereign nation, uh, three, three sovereign nations, the end of a, of, of a constitution. Sovereign nations can be an obstacle to the, the free flow of, uh, of uh, money and goods and labor. 
and uh, if they can erase national boundaries, obviously that would maximize their efficiencies and their profits. But at what cost? I mean, only the nation state is, is best equipped to, to safeguard our, um, our individual uh, inalienable rights. How's your experience been in the European Union over that? Uh, it's, it's rubbish, a lot of rubbish that you use. The issues that most of people face is um, employment. We have a large then, immigration population coming over and so the UK at the moment in the recession are quite worried about having losing their jobs. But other than that, it gives you opportunities that you wouldn't normally get and travel as well is good. I mean, from a business point of view, it, it, uh, it makes business more effective, you know. Um, you don't have to worry about exchange rates and things like that, but it just seems so remote and far away. I mean, it's over in Strasbourg in France, and yeah. we don't really get to hear much about what goes on there. You know, you, you vote once every four years, and then it doesn't seem to change much. Everything is more complicated and bureaucratic, and uh, you got all these like strange laws that maybe apply in France, for example, that in Scotland they're completely irrelevant, and it just makes life more difficult. It's a process of harmonization because you have different social systems, different currency, different uh, quality of life and I think it takes, uh, in this case, maybe 40 years if you have a democratic process. Sovereignty as a concept was born in Europe. It was created in Europe. They created the nation state. The Europeans invented it and through the colonial empire they went globally and then they passed the sovereignty notion on to the rest of the world. The Europeans have thrown sovereignty out the window. Well, the Canadian Council of Chief Executives is uh, an organization um, whose members essentially are the 150 uh, CEOs of Canada's largest corporations. I think we've seen the concept of national sovereignty eroded in a whole variety of ways um, and while it's an important concept um, you know it's compromised by the Geneva Convention it's compromised by every treaty that any country enters into it's compromised by the Charter of the United Nations it's compromised by the uh, by uh, the, the human rights laws uh, so we, you know, I, I don't, I think we need to be a little bit mature about the concept of sovereignty. I find it amusing when people put sovereignty as in, 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 a, in a kind of crystal jar and say, well, this is the ultimate. Sovereignty is the ability of a country to act in its own best interest in accordance with international law and its commitments to other countries. Because really, sovereignty is, national sovereignty is, is one of the tools that we use in order to give democratic expression because we've got to break things down into a more manageable size but at the same time um, it's it's a concept to be exercised with a certain amount of care sovereignty is, is changed so greatly because of the of the phenomenon of globalization where all issues uh, become transnational whether it's trade the environment, health, it's all transnational. And uh, so sovereignty has to be understood in a very different way. And at the heart of sovereignty, you have, uh, you have the absolute requirement for, for deep international cooperation. See, the UN was the first great body that sacrificed uh, a toss sovereignty out the window. You can't simply agree to every international agreement just because people say we live in a, in a global system now, we live in an in, in international society now. Uh, you have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. The people appointed to head these international groups are appointed by bankers, financiers, and multinational corporations, and not by people uh, with any direct link to the people. So they're not appointed by your elected officials, they're appointed by the groups they're supposed to regulate. The idea of accepting a world that is truly global now, a world where we are interdependent without looking at the root causes of that interdependence and without looking at the problems that interdependence has caused is a mistake. Foreign trade is the key to prosperity. Free trade will bring on a great depression. Hitler had a dream that his big business should dominate the world. He called his dream the new water. Foreign big business was weakened during the war 
And today, American big business is the strongest. And they have a dream to dominate the world. This was not a natural occurrence. And just because we do live in a global interdependent world right now doesn't mean that we shouldn't take steps to mitigate that and to reduce our interdependence so we can be independent and we can independently decide what we want for our futures. Canadians are saying no to the North American Union, no to the SPP, and yes to Canada's sovereignty. There are people who, in, who equate sovereignty with shutting down the borders, with not collaborating with neighbors, but I think they've got it backwards. Uh, I think sovereignty means how do you strengthen uh, the nation? How do you ensure that the people in a nation uh, have access to health care and to food and prosperity and to security? And if that's the definition, then maybe the best way to approach that is to open it up, not to close it down. I am a staunch Canadian nationalist because of globalism, because there are global banking and financial institutions and corporations that uh, seek to violate countries' sovereignties by doing whatever they want to those countries with or without the permission of the people in those countries. So because of the, the global forces at play, because of the global banking system, because of institutions like the IMF, like the United Nations, like the World Bank, like the uh, WTO that weld tremendous power over nations already, we need to defend sovereignty more than ever. All other notions that violate sovereignty, including multilateral trade agreements, take away uh, from us the ability to control what happens in our countries. And that's why sovereignty is so important. Sovereignty is where you and fellow people of that country can determine how you want to live in that country. And without sovereignty, you can't. I hope you know who Laura Secourt was. Yeah. She lived on the American side of the border and her husband was in the War of 1812 and he was wounded. So she was looking after him when a couple of American soldiers busted into her house, forced her to belay them, and the American soldiers didn't know how potent our beer was, so they got a little loopy. And they started talking about their plans to invade Canada. And she overheard this and she ran 30 kilometers climbed the Niagara Escarpment, collapsed in front of the Indians, and told John Fitzgerald about the plan to annex Canada. And she stopped it. All the Indians, all the troops, all the settlers, everyone bound together, and we pushed back the Americans. And they left us alone. It breaks my heart to think that all that she did is for nothing. Right. Only for Canada to get annexed 200 years later. We can't let that happen. You need to get out there. You need to tell your friends. You need to tell your family. We need to stop this SPV. To understand what's happening, we should look at what's, what has occurred under the Security and Prosperity Partnership. That was the intergovernmental uh, arrangement that began in 2005 when Prime Minister Paul Martin, uh, President Vicente Fox from Mexico, and President George W. Bush met at his ranch at Waco, Texas, and they launched this partnership. The following year, they met again in Cancun, Mexico, and established what was called the North American Competitiveness Council. And this council has 30 executives, 10 from each country, who have direct access to the policy-making apparatus under um, the SPP. It's the next step towards the North American Union, with the uh, one of the first bigger steps being NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. They have to do it in small stepping stones to condition the people to be able to accept such a thing. So SPP, Security and Prosperity Partnership, is another big step, which is, uh, which is uniting the three into one. I think the SPP was a good idea in principle, but ultimately it failed because it was, uh, it was implemented in a manner that, um, that closed it off to public scrutiny. And the only people who were invited into the room were the largest CEOs of the largest businesses in the three countries. And each working group covers uh, every single area of North American society and it, and it basically says we're going to set the rules for each area of society across North America in, irrespective of what the people in the countries want. What are your thoughts on the SPP? Uh, it's penchant for, for secrecy and the lack of democratic process. This is the, the leaders initiative, the, the Security and Prosperity Partnership? Yeah, the Security and Prosperity Partnership. I think we elect people 
in broad-based democratic processes in order to govern. And when they are seeking re-election, we have the ultimate consultation and the opportunity, if we don't like what they've done, to throw them out. I don't think that democracy means that every citizen is present in every discussion, you know, wherever and whenever it's held. Montebello was the people in 2007, in August, in Montebello, Quebec, were fed up with this two and a half year old trade deal uh, going forward and merging every aspect of their society and harmonizing the regulations to the lowest possible standards according to uh, what corporations want. They were sick and tired of the information not being given out to the public, not being openly shared, and of not being given any input into what was happening with respect to this massive trade deal. So they, they massed in Montebello what looked to be about 1,000, 1,500 protesters. Uh, they, uh, there was a security perimeter around the meeting, uh, and, uh, and there was incredible police presence there. And at one point, the police were even caught infiltrating uh, the protest uh, by uh, three giant muscle-bound, uh, supposedly anarchists, uh, wearing masks and holding rocks, were threatening to throw the rocks at the police. No, no, no! Put the rock down, man! A union leader stepped up and said, take off your masks, put down those rocks, you're not with us. You're a fucking cop, the three of you! Go on, it's our line! These three guys are cops, everybody! Eventually they ripped the masks off the guys, and uh, the guys dove behind the police line. And that was all, it was caught on tape, uh, it was exposed. They were exposed as infiltrators because they were wearing the same boots as the officers who arrested them. Plus, of course, you know, who dives behind a police line for protection uh, if you're a protester? It's something that uh, most protesters would be, would be scared to do, to dive into a, a bunch of police uh, who are there, you know, menacingly, you know, staring at them. As we confirmed yesterday, the three people in question were indeed Sûreté du Québec police officers performing their duties. And what that shows is that shows the fascist lengths which the Canadian government will go to to protect the information about this trade deal. In 2005, when you signed the Security and Prosperity Partnership, um, were you aware at that time of any plans to integrate the uh, countries of Canada, US and Mexico into a North American community similar to a European Union? And considering that the fact that there was no referendum uh, from the people on this agreement. Um, as a former Bilderberg attendee, could you please describe what your intentions were when you signed the SPP on behalf of the Canadian people? Well, okay. Um, uh, I, uh, I attended one Bilderberg meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm not sure they ever invited me back, but, the, um, but, uh, but just to make sure, I've also gone to a Maple Leaf hockey game. That doesn't mean I'm a Maple Leaf fan. Um, yeah. And what exactly is the Bilderberg Group? Well, it's a group of probably around 125 to 130 people that meet every year, uh, heads of uh, state, you know, presidents, prime ministers, the heads of the Federal Reserve and Bank of Canada and multinational corporations like uh, British Petroleum and Coca-Cola and the heads of media and all these really influential people who hold a lot of weight and, and have the the ability to, to affect change in the world. Um, that's who meets at the Bilderberg meetings every year. Uh, the name itself, uh, they don't even technically have a name. Bilderberg is the name of the hotel where they first met back in 1954. I believe the meeting was uh, first organized by uh, Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands and uh, they've been meeting um, every year uh, since then uh, to, I guess, stage manage as best they can 
world events and further control the world's resources. So they've tried to remain secret for a long, long time, and it's only recently that um, the general population is starting to become aware of uh, the Bilderberg Group. I mean, people at G8 summits, you know, pe people think, well, there's a lot of power, there's a lot of influence right there to affect change. And look at the protests that show up to G8 meetings. The people at Bilderberg have way more power and influence than anyone at G8 meetings, yet there's a media blackout. So right away, I have to ask myself, well, why is that? You know, why, why isn't anybody covering this? These guys are bigger than G8 guys. In 1996, you were at uh, the Bilderberg meeting, and also there was uh, Jean Chrétien and uh, Paul Martin. I don't know if I was at that meeting. I've only been to a few of them. Bilderberg and Toronto are not really think tanks. They, they're, they're simply individuals who get together who are from um, business, the political world, the media, others, and discuss ideas. And they influence each other through that. I think the, the, the overall objectives of the Bilderberg Group have been to uh, unite various areas of the world in order to set up uh, the new world order, the, the one world government. Um, they're the ones who are responsible for the formation of the European Union, which really didn't happen that long ago. It was set in place maybe, you know, eight or nine years ago. So those are the guys who, who have the influence and the power, and they are the ones who are also going to be setting up the, uh, the North American Union uh, over here, and there's also going to be a, an Asian Union and an African Union, and um, those are the guys who are working to bring it together. I don't really know what Bilderberg's position on this is, but I, I do understand your question. The Security and Prosperity Agenda, which was signed uh, by Vincente Fox in Mexico, myself and President Bush um, in, uh, in, at Baylor uh, in Texas, and, and you're absolutely right with that part of the question, has nothing to do with an economic union. What it really was, was that uh, uh, Fox and I both said, Fox because of immigration, me because of Matt Cowan because of softwood lumber, essentially said, look, you know, there are a number of items which are violating the spirit of NAFTA. They're not violating the letter of NAFTA, but they're violating the spirit of NAFTA. And if effectively we're going to be able to build a strong North American economy and compete with some of the Asian powers, we've got to, we've got to be able to talk outside of NAFTA. And that's what it was all about. And what we said is we've got to be able to get our business communities together. Because I felt very strongly that we were having a terrible time with Congress on Softwood Lumber. And I really felt that if the Canadian business community was able to deal directly with the American business community and point out some of the stuff, it would give us a bit of a leg up. I can tell you it has nothing to do with any kind of a limit. There was a meeting held in Banff uh, between military, political leaders, private business uh, from Mexico, Canada, and the U.S. to discuss issues surrounding North America. Um, but the meeting was closed off to the public. Um, kind of veiled in secrecy. What, what kind of stuff was discussed at this meeting regarding the future of North America? Um, that was the meeting that Peter Lougheed and uh, George Schultz coordinated? Yeah, it was the one, that, there was a, it was at a hotel in Banff, I believe. Yeah, I think Peter Lougheed coordinated that from the Canadian side. Um, I don't remember exactly. Uh, there, were dis there were general discussions about issues that that uh, um, each country faced. And we had, uh, as I recall, there were some fairly senior people from the U.S. that, that were present. Yeah, I remember them saying um, uh, Donald Rumsfeld uh, might have been down there at that time. No. No, he wasn't there? Let's see, this is, this is what happens when media was cut off from it. That's why you get misinformation, disinformation. Once you get the media out of, out of things like this, they, they can't report authentic I can truth. guarantee you get misinformation when the media is present also. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Why keep the media out of it? If there's so many important people there, some big decisions could be made that could help inform the public more. But there's, it was not a decision-making group. Um, I mean, I was there. I'm just a lawyer from Toronto and Ottawa, you know, so I have some experience and um, I can, you know, I can talk knowledgeably about the issues that, that we face, but I'm not making any decisions. I don't hold any office. 
I don't buy into the conspiracy theories around meetings. Uh, I think some of that is deliberately misinformative. Um, uh, you know, do we need the media to be probing and to be asking questions? Uh, absolutely. And there, there's no doubt about that. Can you have uh, meaningful, productive uh, meetings with the media present? Sometimes. Um, sometimes you don't, you know, if the media are present, you don't have a meeting. So, you know, so, you know, you just have to, you have to, you have to do things, you know, with a certain practicality to it. You have three primary groups that have been working on this for some time, more pronounced since the uh, Second World War, but uh, there are three key, key groups involved, and this is the Council on Foreign Relations, or its sister arm in Canada is the Canadian Council of Chief Executives, which is about 150 executives of corporations which control over $3 trillion in assets in Canada. Uh, the Trilateral Commission, which is uh, by and large looking for this world integration and uh, the Bilderberger Group, which is a group of individuals who see this whole new uh, role for society building this global elite of integrating all of the countries together under one global single parliamentary command. So a new world order is being sold to the populace as being something that's good for us, for our own security and our own prosperity. It's not been voted on, uh, public are not even where it's going on, but it's all part of these steps of changing the laws of the land where you have regulatory bodies and corporations dictating what happens in nations and we end up losing our nationhood and our sovereignty, which is quite frightening. The, the only um, prominent non-governmental sort of group that have really paid a, a good deal of attention to this has been the Council on Foreign Relations and their task force did come out with an articulate and Mr. Pastor was involved. A vision, well argued, John Manley in Canada. It was a very distinguished group of uh, Americans, Mexicans, and Canadians who argued for a North American community. Well, we we tried to work uh, uh, collectively with a broad representation from all three countries: Canada, the United States, and Mexico. Um, we were looking at really NAFTA. Um, that many years, more than 10 years after it came into effect, saying, you know, what, what should be the next steps? Where, where can we go from here, if anywhere? And there was a broad range of views, certainly among the, 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 the people that the Council on Foreign Relations asked to be part of that. The Council did not endorse it, because the Council doesn't endorse the work of its task force, and they didn't hold any, you know, public meetings on it. But it was, a, a, they, they, I think, went beyond anything that has been occur, occurred in the Trilateral or Bilderberg in analyzing the merits in this uh, paper they produced on this task force. I think that we uh, struggled a lot with this basic question. I mean, do you want to be, you know, bold and brash? Do you want to be incremental? Um, do you need a common view for all three countries? Uh, can there be a common goal but moving at different speeds? And uh, so, uh, you know, we tackled a lot of those issues. We tried to make, I think, a, a, a contribution to uh, the direction that countries might go. At the end of the day, has a lot been accomplished? Not really. Um, but, you know, sometimes these things take time to, to bear fruit. What are your thoughts on a North American Union between Canada, America, and Mexico? Um, I, I don't know. I think with the free trade agreement, we pretty much have that right now, don't we? So there's no point you're just going to change the name. It's the same thing already that we have. Well, I don't agree with it. I mean, we've already got the uh, NAFTA agreement with uh, Mexico and the United States. Pues yo pienso que primero se tendría que establecer claramente en qué nos beneficiaría y en quién en qué nos afectaría. Pues más que nada yo pienso que pedir la opinión de la comunidad eh, de cada país, que al fin y al cabo pues somos los que más resentimos ese tipo de, de unión. Pues considero que no ayudaría nada a México porque porque resulta de que nuestro dinero no está mal. I don't think it's really a good thing at all because, um, what, I mean, what does that mean for Canada and where Canadian citizens stand? I don't see them coordinating any kind of 
understanding that everyone can be on common ground with. And the corruption too. Who gets what? You know, who's going to provide the leadership? Who get? You know, you you don't know how society exists these days. It's very difficult to get any kind of truth. It's obvious that there is another agenda going on here. If this was something that was for everybody's benefit, I mean, it would be front page news. But because it's not, because it is secretive, you got to ask why. Why the secrecy? Why wouldn't they tell us about this? Well, because the corporate interests. Um, are basically the ones that are benefiting from this and if anybody looked at the actual amalgamation and what they have proposed they'll see that it's only good for the corporations. Do you think it would be beneficial for people or more beneficial for corporations? Oh, look, I, pro, yeah, gee, that's a tough question. I, I'm hopeful that it would be more beneficial for people but um, my feeling would be that it's probably going to benefit more corporations. Well, I think as an American and all other Americans should agree that it's obviously a plan to destroy national sovereignty. I think that if we're going to adopt laws from other countries, then we should have a say on it. I've heard about that, but I think it's going to be bad. In the event of a, uh, a financial melt meltdown or, or any type of economic disaster, borders contain that disaster to that specific nation. And when you eliminate all borders, how do you contain things? You don't. I'm 16th generation Canadian. And you know what? I love our neighbors to the south. I really do. And I'd like them to remain our neighbors to the south. We have more control of our own destiny when we're not worrying about the other factors, the other people in our uh, union. So if you're worrying about the Mexicans, what they may hold important, we may not. So I think we can get along with them and do business with them, but I think it's better to do it as an individual rather than as a, a separate or as a union together. That's my personal opinion. It's almost inevitable, I would say, that happening. Uh, Why do you think it's inevitable? Everything, everybody's becoming in, more interconnected these days, I think. I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. concerned. You're concerned about the, about the future? Definitely. <laughs> yeah, no, me too. Yeah, me too. The North American Union uh, is an idea uh, essentially put forth by the Council on Foreign Relations. They wrote a document called Building a North American Community, and they are a think tank of about two or three thousand of the business and political elite in the United States who have common interests. Uh, those common interests aren't really defined much to the public, but you can go to CFR.org to see the CFR's own website. You can do your own primary source research by going to their website, looking at their publications, and seeing what their members decide would be a good idea to see. Now, they don't have any official political power, though a lot of their members are politicians. So what they do is they are a think tank of the business and political elite who come up with plans that the government adopts uh, without the, the say of the rest of the public. Up until about six years ago, we never saw in major U.S. papers or Canadian papers never a mention of Bilderberg. Now it's finally all over the place. Europe is all over the place. Uh, what is that a sign of? What is that a sign of that this is happening? It's a sign that that an independent press is growing. What I don't know is are enough of the public listening? That's my great prayer: is that enough of the public are listening? Because you can keep telling them, I can keep telling them. But is there enough of the public going to listen against the against the tidal wave of trash media? You know, all the all the cheap thrill stuff, all the commercial stuff. Are people really going to learn what's going on? Because what is happening to the United States, to Canada, to Mexico, is terrible, terrible, terrible stuff. Can you talk about the American Union? I mean, the CFR writes the white papers for their agenda. They carry out Bilderberg's orders. That's on record. And there, and even Lou Dobbs on CNN saying American Union, end of Canada, end of U.S. They are actually through the trade deals already starting to bleed us. Well, I, I breezed through what in Canada we've referred to as the Manley Report. John Manley was a previous uh, Deputy Prime Minister, and he sat on a Council of Foreign Relations committee with Mexicans and Americans. And, and it started off by saying, does it not make sense that, that, that Canada and the U.S. should be one, uh, that we should have a common currency? Does it not just make enormous sense that we should have a common border? To ask the question is to answer it. Now, that was right in the report. I know they're just waiting for us to look the other way so they can whisk it through. Do you think they're upset about the fact that they're being exposed? Well, I'm sure they are. I mean, look at the tinted windows. They, they don't want to be seen. They don't want even anybody to know they're here. So I'm sure they're ticked. 
you know, and that's why we're here to try to expose them. The American Union is happening through trade deals, just like the Euro back in the 50s when they first set it up was this economic community or this trade bloc. Now it's the Euro and now they're taking people's right to vote, taking their sovereignty, giving it to these supranational organizations. So, so we're talking about the death of Canada is what's happening in there right now. The death of your sovereignty is happening in there right now. CNN has even reported that these individuals have put out the policy reports through the Council on Foreign Relations that writes their scholarly white papers to end the United States, to end Canada, and to end Mexico. What is biometric identification and how would this be applied in North America? Well, biometric identification is uh, using the, the characteristics which are unique to each individual as a means of identifying who they are and uh, we currently use it between Canada and the United States as part of the Nexus program where we have uh, um, iris scan identification. So at airports, if you're a holder of a Nexus card, you can, you can go and put your eye in front of a machine and it reads your iris and it spits out a card saying who you are. And uh, you can use that with your customs declaration form. So it's, a, it's just a means of, of, of certain identification. There are different ways of doing that, but, uh, but, but that's an example of one. That was kind of the thing that people mentioned. They said that, you know, this is one more step towards an Orwellian state of everyone being on a database or something like that. I, I've got news for them. They are already on a database. Oh, really? They are. Uh, which database? Well, have they got a credit card? Yeah. Well, they're on a database. What are you most concerned about? Identity theft or the fact that you might be on a database when you're already on a database? I think quite frankly your privacy is more likely to be breached by virtue of the information you supply credit card companies into in order to acquire credit than by any linkage of your information to your biometrics. Uh, at least you know where you've got biometric identification, identity theft becomes almost impossible. And increasingly, for many people, identity theft is, is a nightmare. Uh, once it happens to you, you never want it to happen again. So in a modern world, you know, every technology has its upsides and its downsides. And, uh, and for some of the benefits, uh, sometimes there are some compromises. What are some of the lessons that we can learn from the old world order for the new world order? Well, I think the first and most important lesson is that if we want to build a community of nations in North America that goes beyond just enlarging the market, uh, that we have to give serious thought uh, to what our vision of the future is. Uh, and more importantly, how all three countries that are quite independent and sovereign ought to relate to each other in a modern 21st century world. Our economies now are very integrated. Our societies are growing increasingly integrated. What's needed now is a North American idea for all three, uh, an idea that not only defines our shared history, but a shared destiny. If we are to progress together and collaborate in a new way, it's also important for us to develop a sense of being something larger, a sense of being part of North America. Right now at the elementary school level, we by and large learn about our country and about how we differ from our neighbors and the rest of the world. I think it's time now to also learn, in addition to how we differ, what we share in common and what North America is as a whole. It's more than just a geographical expression. I think that students should have a mandatory part of their curriculum that not only teaches them about their country, but also about their country's place in North America. I think from the elementary school level, the secondary, the university level, you can develop on that foundation uh, a great deal more knowledge about what we have in common, about the problems that we share, about strategies for addressing those problems. Uh, and so right through university, we should have 
uh, centers on North American studies that research and, and examine these questions and help all of our peoples know more about each other than they currently do. Frankly, Mr. Ambassador, we lack the trained men who would be able to plan and implement operations in an area where we think is vitally important. Because of this, we are also requesting that your team of advisors include a senior officer who is thoroughly experienced in uh, psychological operations. Very well, sir. I think we can provide you with an expert on the subject. He is concerned with its people, their way of life, their religion, their culture, their sense of national identity, or lack of it. He must know the people of Hostland, for their minds will be his primary objective. He reviews the psychological objectives the United States hopes to achieve in Hostland. Once the people start to consider themselves as a national group, acceptance of their government tends to increase, thus making penetration by subversives much more difficult. Psychologically, the people must be convinced that if it were not for the insurgents, these restrictions would not be necessary, and that when insurgent activities cease, restrictions will be removed. As the people are affected by the program, so the program is affected by their changes in attitudes. A successful PSYOP program will make them perceive things from the desired viewpoint. What thoughts will pass through his mind? What images will he see? What factors will push him in one direction or another? When you run the world, uh, you tend to study uh, how other people have run the world. Just like if you run a successful business, if you want to be a filmmaker, if you want to be an entrepreneur, you might study other business models. The people that currently run the world studied how the people before that ran the world and now want to create a scientific dictatorship. And that means they want permanent and total control over the world uh, forever, so they never have to worry about revolutions again. So oligarchies have always been worried about revolution, always been worried about the people revolting. Oligarchies even popularized the idea of exile uh, back in the 1200s, 1300s, where if the king of France got deposed, then he or she uh, could go to England. And if the king or queen of England got deposed, they would be exiled to France. So oligarchies were so worried about the people uh, rising up in rebellion that they popularized the idea of exile to make that normal and make that an accepted thing you do to make sure you didn't kill your royal family who was a part of your country's history. Incrementally, they condition us to say that it's none of our business to look into things like giant multilateral trade deals that will affect every area of our society. They make it seem like it's not our responsibility. We have experts to take care of that. And the less we control our environments, the more apathetic we get. Placing the frog in a, uh, um, a pot of cool water, where the frog is very comfortable, and uh, you gradually turn up the heat so that you don't, it, the, 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 the change in heat is imperceptible until, of course, the pot is boiling, and uh, it, then it's too late to do anything about it. That's what's happening uh, now. So gradually, step by step, and gradualism is a process that Karl Marx ta talked about. This is right out of the Communist Manifesto, that if you move in baby steps, they're imperceptible. People simply don't take notice. Would you prefer to follow a careful, uh, incremental, small step-by-step -step approach or prefer, prefer a bolder vision for the future uh, and to design and pursue that vision. And an overwhelming majority uh, of both Canadians and Americans said yes to the bolder vision. And the people, I think, are ready. The way I interpret the polls is not that they want a North American Union, but they are quite pragmatic about different ways to relate to each other uh, and open to new configurations in North America. They learned long ago that you cannot just take it by brute force. I mean, when Hitler tried to do it, you know, uh, you know, just, just take it by brute force, it doesn't work. The people will always prevail. So they, they've learned their lesson, and they realize that now you have to do it through stealth. You know, through things like propaganda and controlling the media and the education system. And basically turn it around so that the people are in complete and total acquiescence that they will literally beg for their own enslavement. 
by doing incrementally these changes in our laws and our land, then one day we'll all wake up and say, oh, that's just the way it is. But it was not supposed to be that way. You can come across a border with a, an army with all of your military uh, uh, machinery and people say, oh my gosh, we're being attacked. But right now we're being attacked, but incremental changes is a way that people don't see that the arrows and bullets and guns and cannons are blazing at us and we don't recognize that. So most people aren't aware because of what they've learned from the media and what they learned in school. And <laughs> it's, it's amazing how quick information spreads these days. So that's probably why uh, people have such a hard time waking up sometimes, because the, the, the conditioning runs deep. If you get into an elevator and there's 20 people on the elevator and 19 of them are facing the back of the elevator, well, uh, by social conformity, although you, the right thing to do is to face the front of the elevator because that's where the doors open, to fit in with the greater crowd. You turn around and face the back. Don't know why, but this is what seems to be the status quo. When you have incremental damage and it keeps increasing, you can wake up one morning and realize that something has to be done. Well, you get political change of fundamental nature of this sort only if you have a real big earth-shaking event. 9-11 was an earth-shaking event. The Great Depression was such an event. Two world wars costing millions and millions of lives and casualties among European countries was such an event. They drive changes. The European Monetary Union was the outgrowth of people who lived through at least one of those wars to try to avoid it in the future. Y probablemente no porque tú sabes que los más ricos en tiempos de crisis se llaman. Nosotros seguimos haciendo la lucha por la subsistencia de vida. Well, I certainly agree that it's when periods of great instability and chaos, you, you have the greatest opportunity for creating new institutions and moving in new directions. I think it is obvious from any study of history, world history, that the greatest initiatives have usually emerged, originated from some crisis of some sort. The United States Marshall Plan would have been unthinkable after World War I. But after World War II, uh, we were prepared to give a substantial amount of money both to winners and losers to help them to recover. It was quite a dramatic, and it really did require a crisis. A dual crisis, one, the end of the Second World War, and the second, the prospect of uh, Soviet invasion of Western Europe. I think we needed a crisis to have Social Security, to have the Works Progress Administration. In 1935, Franklin D. Roosevelt put his signature on the Social Security Act. This Social Security measure gives at least some protection to 30 millions of our citizens who will reap direct benefits through unemployment compensation, through old age pensions, and through increased services for the protection of children and the prevention of ill health. There's no doubt that steps that many people think would be desirable uh, are extremely difficult to do in the absence of some uh, moment in which people can step back and see that fundamental change is required. Robert Pastor and Alan Gottlieb, they both, they both expressed the, their beliefs that the greatest initiatives uh, come out of disasters. Um, do, you believe, do you believe in this, this order out of chaos theory, uh, given that the European Union was born out of two world wars, do you think that North America would require some sort of a catalyst to push us towards this, this North American community? Well, I, I don't see uh, any, uh, I, first of all, I don't know what kind of catalytic event it would, it would take. Um, I, I don't see um, any interest in building a kind of common superstructure in North America, either political or, or even economic. I don't see a monetary union. I don't, it, none of that is on the horizon at all, as far as I can see. I don't know what it would take for it to, 
to, uh, to come about. The recent uh, events in the financial world uh, are certainly going to drive more cooperation and collaboration around financial sector um, regulation. If, as part of your goal, is to integrate economies, we call it deep economic integration, uh, and integrate their economic structures, then countries don't want to give up their economic structures freely. And if things are going well for the people, and they say, well, thank you for offering us this uh, Amero or North American Union or one common currency across the North American continent, but we're happy with where our economy now, we're happy with our own currency, and uh, we don't need any help right now. But if you throw a man or a country into uh, quicksand, and then all of a sudden they'll clutch at straws. And the straw that they'll clutch at, you already have for them. But they won't reach for it unless you create the crisis and put them in there. I agree with many people who say, well, the idea for an Amerigo is, is just uh, fantasizing uh, because there simply is not the political will that existed in Europe. And I say, that's right. I fully agree. But as an academic, I'm supposed to be thinking ahead of what can be done, what should be done, rather than just always accepting the current situation as it is. If you want to move a population as a whole and galvanize their common thinking as a one galvanized response, and we all agree this, then they give you their will freely to go take them to where you already want to go if you throw them in that quicksand and then you has, pass them that, uh, that straw and a, and a drowning man will grab at anything. And they're drowning us. I've been paid very generously all my life, uh, being a professor, devoting myself to putting out these ideas. And my hope is that eventually, if there is a major catastrophe, there will be enough people around who will say, well, this may be the time to try out this new idea. When, whether this ever happens, I don't know. But as far as I'm concerned, I've done my job of introducing these ideas into the public domain. And now it's up to your generation of young people, the next generation, to see whether it's worth it or not. It's a process that they've been using for thousands of years. It's called, it's basically order out of chaos. And the idea that death breeds life. They believe if you can cause enough, pain and wars and suffering, uh, then out of the ashes of that will emerge their solution to this problem that they created, which is their solution would be oneness, one world everything. It's also known as the Hegelian dialectic, where you, you set up the thesis, you also set up the antithesis so that you can offer your synthesis to the very uh, problem and opposition that you created in the first place. I mean, that's exactly what these people even talk about. It's the Hegelian dialect, problem reacts to solution. They cause the problems to happen. You react to it and you go towards something that they already set up for you from the beginning. And that's how they get what they want, because they understand they can't just get rid of the Constitution. They can't just obliterate your rights. They can't just destroy this economy. They have to think of a plan to do it. Real freedoms are eaten up a little at a time, while government controls are slipped on, while the real power is collected into a few hands. Where government is not limited, no man is free. Change limited government to unlimited government, and our rights would be only what the master planners say they are. No longer the servant of the people, government would be the master of the people. That's the way to change what we have, take all power and all freedoms away from the people, and collect everything into the hands of one small group with absolute power. 9-11 was one of their plans for a push for a one world government. People saw this outside threat, and they ran for the government for help that destroyed their rights, that invaded countries, that killed millions of innocent people. A good example is around six, 7,000 years ago, 
in Egypt when there was the Egyptian leaders would have uh, knowledge of the eclipse and the sun cycles. Uh, the knowledge had been handed down to them from their ancestors and they didn't know why an eclipse would happen or how but they knew when. So they would say okay everyone you have to you have to worship me as your divine leader and your God. Well I don't want to do that. Who, who are you? You're just another guy. Why should I worship you? And then he would say okay well if you don't want to bow down to me then tomorrow I'll get my God to eat the sun and spit it back out. So the next day when the eclipse would happen everyone would just marvel and say oh my god this guy must be our divine leader that day comes by there's an eclipse everybody freaks out and they end up doing as the rulers is either way they want it or not now there's absolutely no way that we can tell for sure they were doing this or saying that i'm just trying to show you the potential use of the knowledge in the hands of five or ten percent of the population just manipulation of the information to control the masses pretty much what we have today now he's going to say right. that turn so, on the tv just the tv that's yeah. right media now they create order out of the chaos they create basically what they do is they take a stable society of individuals who are doing their own thing they're making a little love making a little money making a few mistakes and living within a given system then they introduce radical changes to that system they introduce radical new ideas our enemy is a radical network of terrorists and every government that supports them they introduce radical new threats the people of the United States and our friends and allies will not live at the mercy of an outlaw regime that threatens the peace with weapons of mass murder. We will meet that threat now with our Army, Air Force, Navy, Coast Guard and Marines so that we do not have to meet it later with armies of firefighters and police and doctors on the streets of our cities and they get all the people prepared to make entirely new decisions and think in entirely new ways that facilitate more plans for more control by the people at the top. You're free and freedom is beautiful and uh, you know it'll take time to restore chaos and order but we order out of chaos but we will. Create a crisis terrify the people into going for a solution that you suggest which gives you more control. It may temporarily keep the people safe but uh, in the long run, uh, the people don't know that you engineered the crisis, so they trust you even more, and they get habitualized to accept the next crisis and the next, uh, the next move towards more control. You've got to look at who benefits from that, because the people that benefit from that may have engineered it in order to bring order out of chaos. each of us has to build a new world order in which nations and peoples with different systems and different values can live together in peace. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order, a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. Now we can see a new world coming into view. A world in which there is the very real prospect of a new world order. It is a big idea, a new world order, where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause to achieve the universal aspirations of mankind. Out of these troubled times, our fifth objective a new world order can emerge. There is a chance for the President of the United States to use this disaster to carry out what his father, a phrase his father used I think only once and hasn't been used since, and that is a new world order. There's a need for a new world order. In the next few years, a solution will emerge that people will look into that cauldron and decide that they have to learn their limits. But I think that at the end of this administration, with all its turmoil, and at the beginning of the next, we might actually witness the creation uh, of a new uh, 
would it? After 1989, President Bush kept said, and it's a phrase that I often use myself, that we needed a new world order. It is a new mindset that the world now needs. It is a real global new deal that we need, an ecological and an economic new deal that we need in the name of France. I call upon all states to join ranks in order to found the new world order of the 21st century. I think the new world order is emerging and with it the foundations of a new and progressive era of international cooperation. We need a world of shared global rules founded on shared global values. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order, an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders. The new world order essentially is an agenda. It's a plan to unite the world into one, whether it be one world government, one world cash system, one world religion. Um, it's all about uniting everything into one. They call it the new world order, and that's what they're trying to create. Essentially different power blocks from around the world decide to get together and agree to carve it up amongst themselves with a system where they all profit and the whole world is fooled into believing something else. This idea of a globalization or a global uh, totalitarian uh, political scheme where uh, the masses are regulated and controlled uh, by the few is nothing new in society. It goes back millennia. This has been a common theme of those who seek to profit us and to uh, oppress us and to hold us in checks and balances. Pick up letters from Henry Kissinger where he plans for a one world government, where he talks about an outside threat, whether fake or real, using it as a way to scare the people so they accept and love the New World Order. North American Union and can help them move into a global economic system, a global political world, where they can destroy all borders, where there'll be no Mexican border, no Canadian border, and we'll all be under a world system. Then you're looking at world domination type stuff, and I, you know, I don't, I think, I think there's too much diversity in the world to do that. It comes down to the bottom line, which is money. Those who have the gold want to keep it, tend to. They're not, they don't want to lose power. It's about power and economics. Yeah. yeah. Economic crisis, you, you see it now as, on a global level. The first time people are talking about global regulation of markets, right? Because of economic crash. So somebody has to be shot before you notice that the weapon is dangerous. How about global government down the road? What about that idea? Oh man, I work for that. I, I, I work in that and uh, um, you, have to, you have to make it up to 190 countries. Uh, it's a long process. Pues la globalización ya ve que es inevitable. Pero pienso que más que en el mercado nos está afectando también culturalmente. Eh, se están perdiendo muchas tradiciones y pues ahora ya casi en todo el mundo escuchamos el mismo tipo de música. Este, las tradiciones pues se están perdiendo porque estamos nosotros absorbiendo las de otros países. Well, the end game is it's not going to stop with the North American Union. It's going to be one further step along the road to one world government. Already, as we speak, the uh, nations of Africa are uh, contemplating an African Union. In fact, uh, they, had, uh, they made a fairly large step forward in 2007 with a summit. Speaking at the event, Ambassador Saeed Jinnit, AU Commissioner for Peace and Security, called the launch an historic moment in the partnership between the U.S. and the AU. He said the African Union is determined to pursue the path of continental integration with the support of its partners. Of course, we already have the European Union. Uh, a similar movement is afoot in, uh, in Southeast Asia and also South America. 
So once you have a North American Union, that'll merge with uh, the European Union, that'll eventually merge with Africa. So these four, five, six major trading blocks will all come together uh, as one world government. There is a, uh, an organization you can find on the internet, and they also were in touch, and they want a common currency for the world as a whole. And Robert Mundell has uh, an annual conference in his place in Italy where we discuss these issues. But uh, my view is that uh, this is totally premature. The first step would be to have regional monetary unions, like say one in the Caribbean, one for Central America, one for uh, South uh, America. And once they have been established and they see all the benefits that come from it and that it is manageable, that the problem of losses of national monetary sovereignty do not appear or seem to be very small, then you can have these regional unions getting together and reaching agreement to stabilize the exchange rates amongst themselves. I believe that there is an opportunity now with the G20 having been, having been called for the first time for us to put together a global steering committee of all the great powers of the world. If I was asked what is the single most important thing that can be done to get us out of this mess, it is going to be to recognize now that we are one common humanity, divided perhaps into economic entities called countries. The time has come for us to work together. Do you think it's possible down, somewhere down the road to see a, a North American Union that might merge into some sort of a global governing body? <laughs> One world government? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, I, I don't see the likelihood of, of establishing a North American Union in our lifetimes. I don't think that the people in any of the three countries want to dissolve their government in favor of a single government. M moving to, you know, global governance dealing with, you know, political and other things, I, I don't see it, quite frankly. I think that we are struggling already with our global institutions, such as the United Nations. We're trying to find a way, you know, to deal with uh, situations that arrive uh, uh, from time to time in the world where we've got you know, you've got a, you know, where the global community thinks maybe national sovereignty is not such a good thing. If you think that your government in Ottawa or Washington is somewhat distant and unresponsive, imagine how uh, distant and unresponsive it's going to be if uh, our government is now situated, uh, let's say, in The Hague, uh, in the Netherlands, or in Rome, or some other place uh, that might be the seat of a one-world government. We're not talking about the American government here. We're talking about an entity that exists uh, above or beyond uh, elected officials. These are unelected oligarchs. And these are people that have no allegiance to a uh, country or flag. So it's a bit of a misnomer to, to, to describe them as uh, you know, the American government. We're not talking about uh, the American government here. Um, we're talking about globalists. People of the world, look at Berlin where a wall came down, a continent came together, and history proved that there is no challenge too great for a world that stands as one. While the 20th century taught us that we share a common destiny, the 21st century has revealed a world more intertwined than at any time in human history. In this new world, such dangerous currents have swept along faster than our efforts to contain them. And that is why we cannot afford to be divided. The burdens of global citizenship continue to bind us together. Partnership and cooperation among nations is not a choice. It is the only way, the one way, 
to protect our common security and advance our common humanity. I could see um, in, in, a, in a half century in, in, or less or more China evolving into the status of an of a superpower, possibly, possibly India. Uh, Europe it will be an area I want hope of great prosperity, but it will not be a political superpower uh, by the very nature of the of the democratic system that underpins it. There isn't that type of consensus behind it. So, the United States power will decline, but I think that it's unlikely to be replaced by uh, equivalent power anywhere else. And I think that for even those countries we talked about, they their problems will be very, very great in the future, as America's will be. Uh, and I, I think that I'm, I think it's a safe bet to say that in the world of the 21st century, all the powers of the nation state, of all nation states, will decline to some extent. We're moving towards the uncompleted pyramid being finished, which will be the new world order, one world government, one world religion, one world cash, total enslavement. I think the idea of having uh, a union at the North American level uh, or a single world government is really more of a red herring that people who are fright frightful of any collaboration with any country uh, throw up as a way to try to avoid uh, discussing any serious issue. I think the greatest threat to our three countries are those people who try to intimidate others from having a genuine debate on what our long-term interests mean and those who think that we will prosper by remaining stationary, by not changing. I think that is the greatest threat that we have to avoid. Incrementally, through virtually every uh, means of communication, they're inculcating in the idea, uh, the idea in us to, to not care about our sovereignty, not care about our independence, not care about ourselves as individuals and our individual worth as we chase uh, things like money uh, that become you know, what our self-worth is based on, or looks that become what our self-worth is based on, which are based on ideals. And those ideals are designed to, to corrupt the way we think about the world, the way we value ourselves as individuals. If we don't value ourselves as individuals, we won't value our country as an individual country, and then we'll be allowed to be subsumed into a, a UN global government. They can't just come out and start a one world government, a one world order, a one world religion. It's gonna to have to be incremental. And that's exactly what they're doing now. They're slowly joining countries together because they're gonna join all the countries together into their plan for a new world order, a one world government. Because when you have a one world state, a one world government, a one world religion, one world currency, you have less people control more power than ever throughout history. They have to do it incrementally because that's the only way they could do it successfully. When they do it very slowly, people won't see it around them. If they do it really quickly, they know the people will resist, the people will stand up against them and not tolerate their power grab for the whole world. I am not looking to see either, any great progress here towards a, uh, a deepening of our relationship um, uh, on the economic and security side in the foreseeable future, but I personally think it will come. It will come. We're wondering how uh, people would feel in uh, America about a North American Union, uh, kind of like a European Union between Canada, U.S., and Mexico. You got me. No? No. You haven't heard of it yet? No. Have you heard of the North American Union plan? Yeah. Yeah. The Amero? Oh, man, that's way beyond my scope, man. I don't even know what you're talking about. Honestly, it, it wouldn't make a difference to me. No? It just kind of goes right over my head, so yeah. it wouldn't make a difference to me. I, I seriously don't I know. Really don't. I have no idea. Have you heard of a currency called the Amero? No, I haven't. Uh, have you heard of the SPP, Security and Prosperity Partnership? No. It's a deal that was signed in 2005 between Canada, the U.S. and Mexico. Have you heard of the Security and Prosperity Partnership? No, I haven't heard of that. Have you ladies heard of the European Union, where all the countries in Europe kind of merge together into one country? No. No? EU, they use a euro, they have one currency. <laughs> have you heard of the European Union? No. No? No. No. 
No. No? Have you heard of the European Union? No. EU. Okay. If one leader rules everything, do you know how fucked up the world is going to be, man? I find when I mention topics like the Security and Prosperity Partnership or North American Community or even the European Union that people have never heard of this stuff before. Do you think that people need to be encouraged uh, to start looking into these issues if we're going to be facing them in the future? Well, I, I think that uh, information and uh, a knowledgeable public is a fundamental requirement for a democracy. And uh, I, I worry greatly about the fact that, that people are, in many cases in our modern democracies, will, willfully uninformed. It's not that the information isn't available, especially with the internet. You, you can get information if you want it, but people just aren't interested. Um, in, a, in a recent by-election in Ontario, 25% turnout. 25%. Unlike Afghanistan, nobody was threatening to cut your fingers off or to kill you if you voted. So but there is a lack of democratic engagement, and, uh, and, and part of that is a lack of involvement with understanding the issues, whatever they may happen to be. No have the possibility or the government to give you more information. Here, the little you see on the TV, and the little you hear is what you can see and know. Volvamos a lo mismo, todo es un genérico de desinformación. Yo te podría expresar más si yo supiera, pero como el tiempo para subsistir no nos da tiempo para informarnos. The main problem is nowadays, I mean, you, you have a family. I mean, both parents have to work just to scrape by. Um, pe people don't have time to look into these things. So, uh, and it's often. Um, a survival mechanism where people tend to be happy and comfortable in their own little uh, comfort bubble and, and to, to step outside of that and to have somebody suggest to you that um, the way things are run is not necessarily the way you, you think they are, it makes people uncomfortable because now you have to admit that maybe you're wrong, you have to admit that maybe things aren't the way you thought they were. Um, so really what people need to do is swallow their pride and seek truth honestly and unbiasedly. Because that is the ultimate weapon in the fight against the people's minds, is the truth. Right now, there's a war on for your mind. And right now, these people, they're not doing it by force, they're doing it through policy. People are slowly beginning to, to wake up to the fact that the fourth estate um, has simply not done their job with regards to North American Union or 9-11 or uh, any of the other significant um, events that have occurred over the last 15, 20 years, probably even further back. People are waking up. They're not getting the truth from the fourth, fourth estate. The mainstream media uh, will deliberately lie to you. They will distract you from the truth. The only threat is an informed, educated, participatory democracy and uh, we're not participant and we're choosing to be in, misinformed by the propaganda given to us and we're not educated on these issues. We have by and large a, a, a bi-party system in Canada. Uh, you have your liberals and you have your conservatives. In the United States they have Republican and Democrat. But society, individuals as a whole, we are, get all excited at election time and we let an individual who's been appointed to that position to go fulfill that role, and the people who are appointing them are the very people who want to march us down to this whole globalization North American Union. We are losing our nation before our very eyes. We are at war. The other side is playing for keeps. And Canadian citizens are not standing up for this great country. And we need the citizens of our nation to stand up, stand strong, stand free, and vote themselves into power and take back what is rightfully theirs and their children to come. There are hundreds of elected officials to work on in this country at the federal, provincial, and municipal levels. You can, you can, you can go to them with a group of people and say, we want the fluoride out. Here's our evidence. What do you think? You can have a petition uh, in your local neighborhood where you say, look, we've looked into this. The 10, 15, 20 of us in this neighborhood have looked into this and we just need your help convincing our city councillor to look at this DVD. 
you can have a copy of it too so we're all judging the same thing. And then the people in your neighborhood can see it and they can say, yeah, of course the city councilors should watch this and of course the city councilors should vote against this. And you can have all sorts of incremental changes at the grassroots level. It's possible through the political process by electing uh, parliamentarians who are critical of the agreements to bring about change. Every time an election comes around and someone comes to your door handing out pamphlets, invite him inside and tell him what you know and ask him what he's going to do about it or she's going to do about it as an elected representative. They have to know that we know. They have to know that we're not going to stand for it. Start getting actively involved in local politics because real change is not going to happen with a senator or a congressman or a president. It's going to happen in your city hall. It's going to happen with your sheriff, your mayor. And your little towns and communities, you could have the best change there because it starts with the people. And we have to understand the more we use our hearts and minds, the more we spread this message, the more we talk to people, the more we communicate people, the better life we will have for us and our children in the future. I am very proud to have all of you guys here. You guys are my family. You guys are my friends. You guys are my companions in this info war. And we will be successful one way or another because there is no defeat in our hearts. Whether it's raining, whether it's cold or miserable, we are still out here because we love this country. We love this yeah. flag. Take and we love back. our freedom. Yeah. Liberty and justice for all, including sick and dying, not 11 first responders. number of, of uh, movements around the world, social movements, citizen movements, that are lining up behind this vision, and I believe it's actually possible. What people need to remember is that we make up the base. They have no power without us, you see. And it all it takes is for enough people to step out of the system to cause a crash. You know, if the corner of the pyramid's missing, well, what happens? It all comes tumbling down. Start a website. Hand out flyers and DVDs. Um, contact your local representatives to ask tough questions to politicians. Just um, get, get more and more involved in, in trying to spread the truth. Because that's, that's really what this world needs. You guys want a DVD? Just want a DVD? You guys want a DVD? Documentary? Free DVD? What is it for? Now what's the basis of this? Uh, it's a uh, doc. It. You've seen it? Yeah. Have you heard of it or? Um, yes, and I watched part of it online. Oh, cool. Awareness is key. Uh, nothing's ever going to change unless there's enough people who know there's a problem in the first place. So that's what this day is all about, spreading awareness. That's as simple as that. You as an individual can say, I'm going to make a, an 8.5 by 11 flyer for my neighborhood. That basically says, look, I make a combined family income of $120,000 a year. I live in a $275,000 house. I live in this neighborhood. I'm from here, and I'm just going to drop this off in your mailbox once a week. And I think if everybody did this, and you, you put on there what you're, who you are and what your intentions are, you can be semi-anonymous if you want, but you basically say, I live in this neighborhood, and I'm making this statement on behalf of people who are basically me in terms of demographic, irrespective of what roles are assigned for us by the media and by our society. I'm one of you, and I have this information to share. So you can certainly do that as well. Uh, there's, there's a million things that, that any individual can do, but I think more importantly, uh, it's going to have to go neighborhood by neighborhood, block by block, because the only reality that you can believe in consistently is one that you are in and one that you share with someone else. We don't need believers anymore. We need doers. And the doers right now are the average citizens standing up, organizing, and coming together under a common good to go save themselves. Because Canada is in peril. And uh, we're not alone. And this whole North American Union globalization is not inevitable like one or two people believe in Canada. It's not. It can be stopped. 
And if people who sit here since the time of Confederation who put our country together could fight and give up their lives to save this country, how dare we as individual citizens in the 21st century sit back idle and say it's inevitable our country is uh, going to this new world order and this new global elite save your country. And uh, we can do that. And Canada is no different from the same patriots and nationalists in the United States or other countries. We're fighting a war together. Whether we're individual citizens of different countries, we have to fight the same people together. We need to come together, get out there, educate, inform your fellow man. Do not be embarrassed. Do not be shy. Do cares if they call you conspiracy theorists. This is the truth. We're in a very tumultuous time, but I'm hopeful that on the other side, when the dust settles, a lot of these uh, institutions that were once um, looked up, uh, looked up to, uh, they won't be around anymore. And we're going to have to build this thing from the ground up. And um, maybe I'm naive, but um, I think it's going to afford us a rare opportunity uh, for more uh, freedom of expression and uh, more freedom of information. It may initially start out with, with small groups like this and in church basements, and, uh, but that's how the most important uh, movements have always started. So um, I, I look forward with um, a great deal of trepidation, but also a great deal of uh, enthusiasm and optimism. say today that this is not a prelude to a North American Union, similar to a European Union. Uh, are there plans to build some kind of superhighway connecting all three countries? A couple of my opposition leaders have speculated on massive water diversions and uh, uh, superhighways to the continent, maybe interplanetary, I'm not sure as well. Manitoba is also taking a major role in the development of a mid-continent trade corridor connecting our northern port of Churchill with trade markets throughout the central U.S. and Mexico. Canada and Mexico are as one. Canada and Mexico have both fought against protectionism, and our two countries have launched an appeal for a reinforced system of global financial regulation. Mexico is doing its part in promoting closer and better integration among countries in North America. The world grows more globalized day by day and is divided into large, increasingly integrated economic regions. We need more integration, not isolation nor protectionism. And we have agreed with Canada on that point in the G20 and other forums. 2009 is also the first year of global governance with the establishment of the G20 in the middle of the financial crisis. The climate conference in Copenhagen is another step towards the global management of our planet.